Hello YouTube, what's going on? Shane 2K here and I'm with a very special guest, ex-NBA player, Corsley Edwards. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, Shane? I'm doing good myself. Um, how, how you holding up during this uh, pandemic and stuff, man? Uh, pretty, I'm doing pretty well with it. You know, it's, it's more time, it's more downtime for relaxing my body. And um, just taking time with the family and getting things done around the house that you normally don't get to do. Um, sure, that, that's about it. And staying, staying fit, you know, just working out, doing push-ups and sit-ups and having your wife punch you in your stomach all summer, you know, all all, all pandemic so you get tight of ass, you know. So it's, it's pretty cool. You guys sound like a power couple if I ever heard one work out together. That's the strongest <laughs> way. That's good. That's um, that's like, su that's surprising. I don't hear that from a lot of couples, especially one with like, an athlete of your caliber. <laughs> I've n I haven't heard that often. Now, you play you played in a lot of countries because I did a lot of research on you. But playing everywhere you did, I was wondering, did you ever need like a translator for the coach or even just teammates or anything like that? Oh man, yeah. Man, I don't I don't know if this might start any problems with between countries, but um yeah, China. China I definitely had a translator and um I had a problem with the coach because he kept saying something. You know, while we were playing, like, and it was like, uh, 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 you know how we, how we speak, we say, uh, uh, at the same time? Yeah. He, he was saying, nigga. So I'm like, hold on, who are you talking to? You know, being asking America, I'm like, hold on, I'm coming from America. We don't do that. You know, so hold on, who are you, who are you talking to? But that was the only problem I really had is translation going on overseas. Yeah, but, you, yeah. you played, I mean, you got to really, like, travel. I was looking up here. You played on like twenty plus teams, Europe, States, yeah. Turkey. Which would you say? What was your favorite country to play in? My favorite country. I'm gonna go with Turkey. Just the fact that like the country code is thirty four, and I wore thirty four my whole career, and I just think it was divine that I was there. You know, so Turkey was one of the most exhilarating places I've ever been in my life, as far as like Wow, that's kind of, that's like crazy. I mean, I've heard about Turkey, especially with Ines Cantor. He always talks about it, but now he's obviously banned from the country because, yeah, that, it's it's rough over there, but I've heard, I've heard it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a nice place. It reminds me of New York City, like the big New York City. That's all it is. Because in Istanbul, it's like a big New York City. <laughs> a large New York City. <laughs> I mean, it's cool to get perspective. Like, I've never really left the state. The farthest I've gone is eight hours, or the uh, the states, I meant to say. The uh, farthest I've gone is like eight hours away, so it's awesome to hear some perspective. You brought up wearing the number uh, 34. Was there a lot of uh, meaning behind that? Um, kind of, because I'm going to go off of that. My coach, he told me that um, when he coached the UConn, he gave it to Ray Allen. So all of his players that, you know, he thinks would make it to the NBA, he would give them 30. That's an 
I mean, who was your uh, coach at UConn? Or, yeah. Oh, my bad, my bad. So, speaking of uh, making the NBA, you did end up making the NBA. NBA. Uh, you played for the New Orleans Hornets for 10 games. And you played you played about 10 games, which, like, it doesn't sound like a lot, but I know how incredibly difficult it was to even get into the NBA to play 10 games. Which away, st- uh, out of all the games you played, which away f- um, fan base would you say was the toughest to play in and which was the best, like, uh, arena to play in? NBA or NBA. Yeah. On NBA. Well, we didn't really have any rivals because we were bad that year. Yeah. <laughs> NBA, so I take everyone like Detroit because I, I recall playing them twice. You know, being able to play against them two times with Ben Wallace and Chauncey Bullis and Rip Hamilton and all them type of guys. So. <clears throat> You also played LeBron in Cleveland. How was that? Oh, that was great, man. I got, I got the blocking shot. I realized how strong he really is. And, like, at that age, you know, we almost gave him his first triple double weapon. So, I, was, hey, I would have been cool just to be remembering on the game. You know, okay, LeBron James' first triple double. You know, so that would have been cool. But LeBron was. A monster, man. Like he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's strong as hell. <laughs> um, man, he's, he's a strong individual. And much respect to him. You know, I, he got the right name, King King LeBron. He got that. Yeah, LeBron. He's a he's a freaking nature. I mean, yeah. even I mean, I didn't. I mean, it says that you had two blocks a game. Hearing that you blocked LeBron, that's like. I'd be telling my kids that forever. I'd be playing it back like a, a million times. That's what I. That's what I explained to my son. I let him know. I'm like, look, man, you talk. That's your favorite player. I block this shot in real life. <laughs> what you got to say? So I get to brag with my son with it. So he he loves it. Like he he eats it up. He become he gets super pumped up about when I tell him things about what I've done and stuff like that. I really don't talk about it, but. Because I see he's getting the basketball for so sure. I give him everything he wants about basketball. Thank you guys too. <laughs> yeah. So actually, you played back to back nights and a combined fifty minutes. Now we've all played a little bit in a basketball game, especially any hoopers that are listening to this. But this is the NBA; it's a different level. I'm guessing European basketball is probably as tough as the NBA. I mean, conditioning wise and stuff like that. But what was fifty mm-hmm. minutes of NBA game time like in t- in two different nights? Okay. Well, it was like, okay, you on your stage. It was like, okay, you got an opportunity to take off. What you going to do with it? Are you going to run with it or are you going to just sit back and just chill out and just let it come to you? So, like, them back-to-back minutes was like, <laughs> it was like exhilarating for me. I went out there and tried to get it all I had. I fouled out. You know, I, I went so hard, like, I fouled out. <laughs> just because I was just, I had so much energy just, like, because I was so pumped up to be out there. You know, so I I went nuts, ball to wall, like seven point seven rebounds and fouled out. You know, so I was like, oh, I gotta get it, I gotta get it. And you know, like those minutes lit everything to me because I know that I gave it all I had. You know, like in mm-hmm. calls on the calls that were made against me, I gave it all I had. You know, so that was, those minutes was like precious to me. You know, precious. Moments in time that I wish I could catch. I bet. I mean, you're kind of because that was like your seventh and eighth game out of your ten. You, I'm guessing you were still fighting to keep a spot on this team. I could only imagine the the also, although it is awesome and precious, the pressure and all of that too. Yeah. Well, after after you think about this, I've been playing about I've been playing basketball since the fourth grade, and playing in front of anybody. And to me, my most biggest credit was my fault. And just being around basketball your whole life, like the pressure really, it's not really a pressure. It's like you're built for that. Mm -hmm. Specifically, you're built just to be a basketball player. So pressure's not really, really handed to you as somebody who 
getting or hasn't been on that stage. You know, like, I, I think that's what I think. You know, like, those, those pressures aren't really there for me. You know, it's just like, okay, pressures of, dang, like, am I going to get up in the morning? Am I going to go hard today or stuff like that? Those are just normal pressures. The pressure of actually playing in the game and being there and being in that environment, I don't, I don't really recall having because I was just so numb to it because I've been doing it my whole life. You know, you said your dad was your toughest kind of... Whoa, sorry about that. You said your uh, dad was your uh, toughest mentor, toughest person while you're playing basketball. Mine was a coach. And that can work in your advantage, disadvantage. If you have a good coach or a tough coach, sometimes it makes you the best player possible. Who would you say in your all your years of playing was your toughest coach? My toughest coach? Hey, you coach Anthony Lewis. I have. He um Cecil Kirk in you program. I'm gonna say him because for me playing with a big guy in a town full of guards, it, it was difficult. Mm-hmm. And for somebody to take a kid like me at six eight or six nine, and be like, okay, this is what you got to do, and put me in the right position to get a scholarship and be able to be put in that place to. You know, like, he worked me so hard, Paul, with with everything, like, just knowing the game and different emotions you feel and stuff like that, knowing the game and stuff like that. So, just mentally, I think my coach, Anthony Lewis, he was probably the hardest coach I had, you know, but it, it built me because I like that. Like, I like that, you know, not just giving to it easy. Because I've never got anything easy in my life. You know, so that's what I think. You know, my coach, Anthony Lewis, is the hardest coach. I like hearing that it was an AAU coach instead of, like, a high school coach. Because mine's a high school coach. He's just he's just awful. But um, <laughs> he, he's terrifying. So he's bald. He, he's just a scary person. Some coaches are from books, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like another big thing in making you like a great basketball player and wanting to grind your craft and make you even better is like a rival. Whether it's waking up at 5 in the morning every day to be better than them and outwork them or just playing better because they're across the court. What rival would you say shaped you the most? A rival? Food. <laughs> I'm going to say food. You talking about physically or mentally? Like, well, playing against someone. Either one. Well, I'm going to say food and rivalry. Um, I don't think I ever told anybody this, but Will Adamsberger, the guy I know, you know, he played in high school against me. And I just wanted to just go at him. Like, he, he used to play in front of me. Like, he showed me that how I had to work harder to get to where I had to go. You know, so that was my biggest rivalry is going at my guy Will. Because then he used to always be killing me. And I'm like, hold on, man, I got to stop this. <laughs> I got to stop this. <laughs> you know, and, it, and he never knew it, I don't think, until he realized, until I grew another six inches, and then it was ball game. You know, <laughs> so that was probably my biggest rivalry going against my guy Will. Yeah, my biggest rivalry is probably against my friend who actually introduced me to basketball. And I, I mean, I'm bigger than him, but I couldn't shoot. So after, like, a summer of just working out on it, and then I started beating him in 1v1s, and that's, like, beating your rival is probably the greatest feeling, like, out there. Uh-huh. Yeah, killing your rival is fun. So I have a question. What do you look for in a good locker room mentality? Um, a good locker room mentality? Mm-hmm. Just guys listening to the best. Somebody who's done it before them. You know, player, a coach that might have been a player. Just giving those guys that respect and listening to them and actually trusting them because those are those guys' jobs. You can always play basketball. Mm-hmm. But once these guys pass basketball, you need to listen to them. Especially like the Ben Carter who was in the locker room. Like Atlanta should have. Soaked up so much information from him. 
because he knows so much about the game. Mm-hmm. He's been around it for 20 years. Like, he's been around it before you guys even knew about the basketball. So, why not soak up all that information? So, that's what I think about a good locker room, you know, presence. It's just the presence of, like, leadership and showing mm-hmm. you guys it's okay to be like, okay, take the back seat regardless of making 150 million. But take the back seat and listen to the guy who might be making ten million and listen to him. He, he, he knows the game. Mm-hmm. He knows the referees. They respect him. So yeah, that's why I think I Yeah, I I love Vince. Do you ever do you ever get to play or meet Vince? <laughs> yeah, I used to hang. I used to shoot. So the time I went to the big three, the first year I shot. I used to shoot every day at his house. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of big yeah, three, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. No, you go on. Head, huh? No, you go on. Sorry. No, I was just saying, like I used to shoot every day at his, at his house. Like I shoot five hundred shots a day, <laughs> and going around in his in his neighborhood. So yeah, <laughs> his car was a he, he, he was a superb athlete, man. He he's a good guy at that too. So you know, like he he he's very humble guy. He likes to have fun like everybody. Humble guy. He's pretty cool guy. Too bad, like, even when, you know, going off to you, like, we play golf a few times and come back in the house, he still dunks. You know, I'm like, damn, like, you can dunk like that still? And you ain't warm up? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Vince That's got I'm some. Surprised. You know, retiring. I'm like, dang, dude, like, you retire here? You still got it. If your leg still letting go, go. Run with it. <laughs> Vince got some bunnies. I hope to see because you play. Do you still play in Big Three or are you a coach now? Yeah, no, I'm playing. All right, I'm going to go a couple more years of this and get me a championship hopefully this year. Hell yeah! I mean, because I saw that you were a coach for or an assistant coach for the Denver Nuggets, but I I get it now. It took it took me a second. But um, who who were like besides Vince? Because I mean, I I would love to see Vince in the Big Three when he retires. I don't care what anybody says. That'd be the greatest thing ever. Uh, Who are some people you want to see in the big three? Like, come to it after retirement. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, LeBron James, for sure. That'd be great. That'd be insane. James Harden, for sure, James Harden. Russell Westbrook, he, he, he'll strive in that. Dwayne Wade, if he comes, um, like, all these superstars, like, there's so many superstars, but it's some regular guys, like, some mid, mid the superstar area, some guys, like, Melo definitely needs to come. Oh, that'd be nice. Like, I would love to see Melo. I love to see my bro. That's that's my little man. He's a cool guy. Um, shit, yeah, there's a whole bunch of guys. They ain't live, like all the guys with superstars in the NBA. They need to just go on, on over once they retire and go play the big three. I think that's what they, they should do. That'd be cool. Like, most of the most time when you finish and you like, oh, I'm done. You get that little itch. You know to do that every week just for the summertime is is it's beautiful. You know, like, you get to do what you want. You know, it's, it's fun. You know, you're still being competitive on a top-notch level and all pros, guys you know, you get to have that brotherhood again and just bring back that brotherhood in the game of ball. So people can be like, oh, well, he is the man, so we got to listen to him. You know, so everybody, you know, everybody play ball. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I think. All the guys should come back, all the pros, all the superstars. You know, I'd love to see Isaiah Thomas try and, like, reboot his career a little bit. Kind of like uh, uh, Joe Johnson did. I would love to see Isaiah Thomas do that. Which, which Isaiah? The little one or the older one? Oh, the little one. No, the older one. Uh, oh, okay. After that I'm Jordan like, docu-series, I, I don't want to see him. No, after that Jordan <laughs> docu-series, I do not want to see that other Isaiah Thomas. No. <laughs> Yeah, Zayn, he he would get he would get gobbled up. <laughs> like I'm gonna tell you this, because Nate is one of the smallest guys in the league, and he has a problem with like posting up because it's three on three, you can't help. Yeah. So like, unless Zeke is up top, 
with the ball and just shaking and dancing is every foul committed or whatever on him so they keep the ball, that would probably be the best way for him, but it would be difficult. But I he hold his own. He's don't don't get me wrong, he's still a pro. He's yeah. still a, you know, a superstar. And shit, like he's 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 still pro. You know, he would just have to handle his own differently. And I know Nate used to handle his differently. You know, that's why, you know, they created the rule, the five-second rule. It's like, shoot, if I can dribble from the three-point line all the way back, Nate Robinson down the whole time and keep him behind me, because we are prone, who's going to stop him? You know, like, so it wouldn't make the game fun, so. Yeah. yeah. Nate was Nate was a god. I remember watching him on the Knicks, winning <laughs> dunk contest. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> He's a monster. He's underrated, it's too. It's impeccable. The work ethic is impeccable. Like, he's one of the hardest workers I've ever seen in my life. Still, like, to date. And I'm like, okay, I've been around a lot of guys, but he, he has a work ethic because he, he's so focused on making sure he stays healthy. And that's the most important part. Mm-hmm. He's a monster, though. He's a, he's a freak of nature. <laughs> <laughs> I don't he, get it. He's, he's so playing, short. He's playing professional flag football. He, he do everything. He's so athletic. Like he, he, wanted, he wanted to play for the Seahawks at one point. Like, <laughs> and I think he could have made the team. No, no more draft he, he probably could have made that team. If he was younger, I think he could have. But, not. I mean, obviously not now. Yeah. Uh, well, he might. Shoot. Like, they I mean, need to bring more elderly. Not elderly, but you know, older players back. I mean, like, a big thing about basketball, I feel like all of us missed. And, like, you were talking about different sports, so I was just imagining, like, Nate Robinson almost playing college football, because that, that would be kind of cool. But speaking about college, you brought the Central Connecticut State University. You brought them to the their first ever NCAA tournament appearance in 2000. I mean, you lost as a 15 seed, but it was close against Iowa. But how do you feel? How, how Like, walk me through that, bringing this team – their first tournament appearance, and then only losing by 10 as a 15 seed. Oh, man, like, it was a dream because we, we were a team just came from Division Two, like, within the last four years. My coach recruited me, told me to come in, said, we're going to win. So my first year, I reassured him, angry, mad, built it all up for the second year, won the championship. Go to Iowa, go to um, Minneapolis, play in Minneapolis, practice in front of all the media guys and just seeing all the you know, universities that we see all year long mm-hmm. on ESPN <laughs> and just hanging out with them guys. So it was like, man, we was like, oh, wow, we're on a big stage. It's not no gym. You know, it's not no gymnasium. We're playing in the arena. <laughs> so, uh-huh. and, that, and all those like lights and cameras and just things that, you know, coming from a small school, we just weren't accustomed to. And we went in there and was like, hey, I told the guys, man, look, we've been playing basketball since the fourth grade, most of us. All we do is just play together. You know, just play together and let's try to win. And we came out on fire, coming at it, like battling back and forth. And then, like, my homeboy told him I he's in my wedding. Um, he hit a half court shot at halftime, and the momentum was all of ours. But we were just like, oh man, let's get him, let's get him. You know, the Jamal Tinsley and then Marcus Pfizer, you know, number two pick or number three pick in the NBA that year. Like, we was like, oh shoot, let's get him. <laughs> and it just was like so, dang, it was just so much going on. Like, we didn't hear no horns, we didn't hear any whistles, we just played ball. And next thing you know, Jamal Tinsley woke up. And looked like he had the boss basketball on the rope on the string, and he just was fiddling it and turning it and spinning it and scooping it. And <laughs> that, that was the ball game. You know, it was like, wow, we, we got put on for a show. Like, he showed us something that we've never seen before. He played our, you know, in our nature. So we went, oh, he's definitely going to the NBA. But yeah, like that, that environment, that the way they played, the way they stepped up. And, 
showed us the small school that y'all not ready. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was an experience, man. Like, I wish I could just bleed out and let you guys hear what I, you know, how I feel about that. Because I'm trying, I can't find the word with, you know, going to the NCAA tournament or something like, you know, coming from a small school, the first time ever in history for your school. And then, you know, just try to be the best you can be. You know, at that time, I was only a sophomore at the time. So, you know, like, NBA wasn't calling and knocking down my door. So, <laughs> like, it was like, okay, that's, that's what we had to play for. So I had to play for my school. I had to play for the championship. I had to play for this. And those feelings, like, let's get it. Let's have fun. Let's play. Just, like, going outside in the summertime, going out on the outside courts, you know, and group of guys out there. Just like Mall Park, you know? <laughs> And yeah. Okay, well, everybody can do that now, but yeah, but that's that's what it feels like, you know. Going out there, you got the next five coming up to play on the, the guys and playing everybody already. That's what it felt like. That I mean, that's a I I love listening to you tell stories, dude. Like, like I can listen to you tell <laughs> old basketball stories forever. If you like. <laughs> there's one more story. Cool, yeah, there's one more story I want to get out of you before we start to wrap it up. What is the oddest or funniest travel story you have of your career? All every MBA outside of MBA, even college, funniest travel story you got? Funniest travel story. Hmm. 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 Don't fall asleep around. That's, that's what I'm going to say. I, I can't put anybody's business out there. So I just say, on the travel, we're going to play. <laughs> we're traveling the park. And, and Jared Jeffries, like, it was so funny. Like, he, he did something to one of the guys. I can't I can't talk about that, but it was too funny. I can't really go into detail. That's too much detail. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I would think that would probably be the funniest, but just all in all, just all in all, like my travel story, damn, I can't even remember. I've been to 13 different things about it. I mean, there's a lot of airplanes I've been on, and a lot of stuff I've been on, so. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's. You stopped me on that one. I don't. I can't even remember. Hey, I'm <laughs> glad you're my you're my fifth interview. You're the first person I've stumped. I'm, I'm happy to hear it. Okay. You're my fifth interview. I'm. You're the first person I've stumped. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, you definitely stumped me on that. <laughs> one. My travel stories. Yeah, that. Yeah, you. You're gonna at that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, starting to uh, wrap this up. I, get, I just got two more questions for you. What's a piece of advice you'd leave for a young basketball player or athlete pursuing a career in basketball currently? Watch the person in front of you. The best, the best thing I can give you is watch the person in front of you because they know what they're doing. It's coach for the ball yeah, and play. And play is just if you want to do plays and stuff. Like shoot around or whatever. And one thing Coach Hanks is a player who comes on after the first group and messes up the play. Mm-hmm. So you can take that in all facts of life, watch the person in front of you, but it's what you want to do in that moment once you watch that person. So, I mean, that's, that would be my word of advice to give somebody current and all that stuff. Because as you see, Tom and Danny is. So we don't know what's gonna happen. So it's just like, just watch the person. If you want to try to be better, that's why I told my son. You know, because I know he wants basketball. It's like he wants to be a top player. Mm-hmm. So I, I give him that. But I gotta watch my video. Like I'm like, dude, you can watch YouTube, you can watch whatever, you can watch me play. He said, I watch that a lot, a lot of times. Like, okay, cool. I said, watch. <laughs> Your favorite players, watch these people, watch Derrick Rose, watch uh, Kyrie Irving, watch LeBron James, watch them people. Mm-hmm. Don't hate on them, just watch them. And then take what you get from them and put it into your own. That's, that's, that's what I get, word of advice. All right, I got 
That was a great answer, by the way. I got one more question. I, I've kind of been ending most of my interviews with it because I think this is a really good question. What do you want your legacy to be when everything's said and done after basketball, coaching, big three, all that? What would you, like, if you were to die in 30 years, let's just say, what would you want your legacy to be when it's, when it's over? He gave all he had. He never, he never was phony. He never was fake. He gave it a hundred, ten percent, or as many percentage as you want to put on to it. He gave it all his life for us. I play basketball for a living. Like, it's no more than you know, a doctor coming to work and putting together something. You know, like just they know what they got to do. And I gave it my all. I didn't have stuff. I say, oh, I didn't feel like it that day. I gave it my all. That would be my legacy. That he never gave up. He all the way he's fucked. Regardless of what the situation is. You know what? That was a great answer. And that was to end an even greater interview. I'm going to link your Instagram, but is there anything you want me to plug? Uh, you, can, you can plug my nonprofit profit and kick so yeah. And myself, you know what I mean? Like that's that's about it. Alright, sounds like, good. My, my, so yeah, that's that's my that's my non profit, man. Like kids in Baltimore, make sure they get in it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you'll send me a link to that. I'll for sure link it one hundred percent. Gotcha. Alright, that you right. that was an amazing interview. Thank you again, man. Everyone course the Edwards, it was fun. That's all, though. If you guys enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, comment someone else you want me to interview. That's all. Peace out.